at the outset, that's to say its formation in 1971, it had a double axis structure. Vertically, from the executive in Montevideo out to the most outlying uh, grassroots committees in the interior, and horizontally, across the socialists, communists, Christian democrats, and renegades from the Colorados and national parties, and other independents and smaller groups that all made it up. Since 1985, and especially as it got closer to exercising power, instead of just opposing those who did, there has been an increasing trend toward combining those two arms, horizontal and vertical. Over the last 20 years, it has also successfully attracted support from two sectors traditionally bound to the Colorados or the Nationals, namely the very poor and marginalized and workers and middle class voters outside the capital city. It has done so despite, or perhaps because of, the very public wrangling that has occurred within its own ranks. For the broad front, open dialogue and debate have been at the forefront of its appeal because they have seen the guarantee of its honesty. While parliamentary representation and municipal and, since March 2005, national government have demanded a public record of discipline and unified efficiency, the Frente's origins as a coalition of disparate ideological forces has meant that there is greater, though not unlimited, public, public tolerance for internal disagreement and debate. Given the Frente's electoral success over the last 20 years, it seems likely that this display of frequently substantial difference of opinion within the party has contributed not only to the Frente's own credibility, but also to rekindling the electorate's more general trust in civil society as a site for reason, intellectual, and political debate. During the transition after the dictatorship, the Broad Front had very little time to gather its forces together before the elections of November 1984. Moreover, the military had refused to allow its then leader, Liber Sereni, to stand as its presidential candidate. Under these circumstances, that its 1984 electoral showing just about matched that of 1971 was a positive outcome for the Frente. Since those early moments of redemocratization, the key years for the Broad Front have been 1989 and 1994. 1989 saw the first major split in the Broad Front's ranks since its foundation in 1971. The Christian Democrats, whose initiative had made possible the unification of progressive forces for the first time in Uruguayan history, and a group that had originally defected from the Colorados, broke away to form a group called New Space. The more conservative section of that grouping went back into the Colorado Party, while the remainder, led by the son of the senator who had made the earlier defection, would later return to the broad front fold under a new title. The main reason for this split was that some moderate centrist groups in the Frente, the broad front, felt threatened by what was happening on their left. One of the most divisive issues again, still in 1989, was the admission into the broad front of the now legalized MLN Tupamaros, a move that the old leadership of the MLN had been planning since their days in prison. However, the internal controversy originally caused by their application to join in April 1986 could be measured by the fact that it took the friend in the best part of three years to persuade itself to accept them. Relations between the MLN and the Broad Front had always been difficult. The MLN distrusted electoral democracy and had only reluctantly, and perhaps even self-destructively, declared a truce in 1971 so as not to be the excuse for the cancellation of what were anyway tense and irregular elections. With 18%, the Broad Front then made the first dent in the traditional party's monopoly on government in Europe. While the armed struggle advocated and practiced by the MLN remained anathema to groups in the Broad Front Centre. In addition, the MLN application to the Front 
coincided with one of the wide-ranging discussions frequent in the post-dictatorship friendly amphitheater, as the groups within it began to negotiate the fallout when events in the, in the socialist bloc during the late 1980s forced a confrontation with the realities of Soviet-style communism and then with its demise. I do not want to go into excessive detail, but I do want to emphasize this important side of the broad front's public face. A representative debate took place between Manuel Laguardia of the Socialist Party's executive and Ebert de Cattel, a political scientist, and at the time also an official from the group that uh, was on its way back to the Colorados, having defected from the Frente. Gatta predictably said that events had proved Marx and Lenin wrong, and all hope now rested on reforming capitalism and representative democracy. La Guarda, on the other hand, argued that the iniquities and injustices of capitalism were clearer than ever before, and that socialism had to be rescued and remolded along the lines of cooperative self-management and the horizontal, more fluid structures of the social movements outside the mainstream, as important in Uruguay in the 1980s and 90s as they were elsewhere. This relatively minor squabble was one of many public events that highlighted major differences of opinion within the Frente Amplio between the late 1980s and the early 1990s. The occasions and the titles may be different, but the problem being addressed was essentially the same. In what ways would the broad front political program, internal structures, and overall strategy need to be changed to adapt to the new circumstances, including a necessary commitment to the compromises of electoral competition, while still offering a genuinely leftist alternative to, to the traditional parties? The form and content of <coughs> Martha Harnecker's, she's a well-known name on the Latin American sort of intellectual left and commentaries on the development of the Latin, uh, Latin America in recent times. Uh, the form and content of Harnecker's examination of the Frente at the time is exemplary, displaying clearly the problems besetting the Frente, but also illustrating its commitment to open dialogue as the means of resolving them. Using roundtable discussion, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and, but only when absolutely necessary, written responses to set questions, Harnecker transcribes the often conflicting opinion elicited from leaders and representatives from the full range of the broad front groups and currents between April 1990 and May 1991. Published as a weekly series distributed at a subsidized price through Montevideo's principal left-wing daily newspaper, the, the result was a very accessible cross-section of perspectives within the party on the broad front's history, structure, and political platform, and on how it should go forward. In June 1990, a seminar on the impact of the collapse of real socialism on the Latin American left featured participants from positions across the Frente, as well as journalists, political scientists, and historians. While two years later, the weekly Brecha could publish a special edition promoted as, uh, quote, the debate the Uruguayan left had to have on exactly the same topic with a similar array of participants. Two years later still, coinciding with the 1994 national elections, came a book of short conversations with 30 members of the Frente, accompanied by relevant extracts from previous published articles and interviews, all on the theme of exactly what it meant to be on the left in the 1990s. Since this was a burning issue on many minds, these displays of disagreement and dissent, far from arousing fears about disunity on the left, accurately reflected the worries and doubts of the left constituents, for whom the confrontation of their representatives and their critics was, in effect, an assurance that their own views were legitimate and shared, and could be voiced and heard in an organization not threatened, but strengthened by internal disputation. Twenty years on, this kind of debate, only slightly less frequent since the broad front has been in power, is more likely to appear on a television screen or FM radio, but cheap print outlets for groups across the whole centre-left spectrum retain their importance in a society where electronic media are often expensive. The year 1989 was not only important for polemics, 
the accelerating implosion of the Soviet